And hopefully this lighting isn't too harsh. Um, I made my bed just for you. <laughs> Hey friends, and welcome back to my channel, or if you're new, welcome, hello, I'm Jeff. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing an illustration project that I recently did for a client, but instead of just sharing the work as is, like a case study, I wanted to structure this video around five tips that I would give someone who is starting out in this field and by that I mean someone who is wanting to do more work as an illustrator who's getting arts jobs based around artwork licensing or large scale print jobs where they're using your artwork to wrap around objects, put on walls, decals, things like that. Where you're relying on a printer to essentially do the execution of your artwork. And the tips that I want to give today aren't necessarily based around the business side of things. So I'm not going to be going into anything like contracts or artwork licensing and that kind of thing. I'm going to be going more into the creative side. So I want to be focusing more on what I do to make sure that the process of creating the artwork is as smooth as possible, not just for myself, but also the printer and also the client as well. So it's a really enjoyable thing and you get the best results. Just as a little disclaimer as well, just remember that these tips are just based on my own personal experience. And I've been doing this style of work for maybe around the last seven years. So I've been slowly building up my process and working things out. So remember, this is just one way of doing it. Take as many things out of this as you want or not. Um, you know, I'm not saying this is the best way or the only way. I'm just saying that this is a way that you could do it. Uh, so yeah, so with that being said, let's jump into it. So here's a really quick context or brief for what the project was. So it just makes sense what I'm going to be talking about when I give the tips. So I was asked by a client to create an artwork that was going across three different spaces within the venue as part of their Mardi Gras campaign. The spaces that I was designing for, so there's one, the indoor bar area. It, in this area, it meant that the artwork was going to be up higher because it was on the top third of the wall and there was already an existing artwork installed in the space, or there is an artwork installed in the space that I would have to obviously address. And then also there was the extra tables that they were interested in me potentially covering as well. So the artwork was going to be seen from a height and then there was those two sort of surfaces that I could address. The next was the bleachers. So these were in the outdoor courtyard area. And when considering those, I had to remember that obviously as people use the bleachers to sit on them, the artwork is going to be obstructed at times. And so I just had to remember that that is a factor of where I was going to put the majority of the artwork or what I was going to make the feature in the design. And then the third space was the side entryway. So the main thing for this space I had to consider was that there was this gap between the two panels that was going to be left blank. And then also it's obviously a really high vantage point from the street. So lots of cars drive past and it's a really open um, entry point for people to walk in. So I wanted to have it as high impact as possible. So the other thing that I had to consider was that we wanted the decals to last longer than just for the Mardi Gras time period. So we wanted to have the actual text be removable. That way the artworks could remain uh, installed in the locations and the different zones for a more permanent time frame. It was great for the venue because it meant they got more bang for their buck because the work was going to be seen for a longer period of time as well. And just in general, in terms of in terms of sustainability, it's a really great way of approaching it that 
it could have very easily been a project that we installed and after two weeks everything gets ripped down and then that's just such a waste of printing and materials. But being able to have these discussions on different ways of being sustainable in our processes meant that the client was really keen for it to be more permanent and yeah, it just meant I was so much more excited to do that, um, to do the project. So the final thing that I had to think about was the venue's audience. You know, who are the people who go there? Uh, I looked at all the other art that was in the space already and it's, there's a lot of street art references. It's really fun. It's really playful. They have a basketball court in the space or a half basketball court. So I knew that the tone of what I wanted to create was going to be playful and fun and I can go really bright and colorful and it was still going to make sense outside of Mardi Gras time frame because obviously during Mardi Gras yes everything is rainbow and colorful but as soon as you take down that Mardi Gras context is the work still going to speak to the space and that set a really nice tone for me as to like what I could actually create for the final artwork. And with that all being said here are my five tips and let's go. Okay, so tip number one is to make a universal template for the space first. This means, you know, getting the dimensions, getting a mapped out, measured up drawing of the space that everyone is going to go from as the master copy. So before I even design anything, and usually before I even take on the job, I like to go in and do a recce of the venue or the space and actually just see it in real life. I think being able to understand the scale of the space, see the different surfaces, and how the space gets used can really influence what I end up wanting to design and how we can apply it to the surfaces. There's no point trying to put something on a big wall that in theory you can't see because there's a tree in the way and no one actually sees it. Or you design something for a zone which is actually just a dead space. So being able to see the space in person is really important. If I can't get to the space, what I'll do is to ask the client to send me lots of photos and even do a video walkthrough of the space. That way you can really imagine what it's like to use it, for them to literally just on their phone, walk around, look up, look around, do 360s. And it just means you get a much clearer idea of what you're getting yourself into. I like to get pictures of the textures of the walls if I'm painting a mural, so I know that if it's a really coarse textured brick or like a really um, flat um, concrete wall, that's gonna change what is possible for me to paint onto it. There's been many a times where I've painted a mural, but I'd never actually touch the wall until the day I was painting it. And if I didn't do something as simple as these walkthrough recce's beforehand or getting the client to do these walkthroughs for me, I could have very easily had a big uh, blunder on my hands because I wasn't aware of what the, the wall textures were like. So that's a really important thing to do at first is to do the recce of the site and actually get a context of everything all together. So as well as doing the recce, you want to get measurements of all the spaces and all the walls and objects that you're going to be covering and then creating this final document with all the measurements is going to ensure that no one is working on two different types of measurements and it's really going to cut down possible errors and miscommunications on things and a lot of the time the client will actually um, have their printers go in and do the measure ups because they want to know what they're printing onto or they're like applying everything onto. So yeah, I always like to go by what, like push for a printer or an installer or a contractor that's like building something to do the measurements because they're the ones who are actually doing the physical work and I'm just sending them a file essentially. So for this project, once I got the measurements from the printer, I was then able to go over into Illustrator and create a master copy 
of all the spaces I was designing for with all the windows, the architraves, the air conditioning units and any obstructions that are going to impact on what my design can be. And while I'm at this stage, another thing that I'm thinking about is when I'm deciding on how to set up my drawing files for the, you know, the final copy, I'm considering how I'm going to draw it the, because the end result can often dictate how you have to set up your file. So for instance, for this project, it was uh, a large scale thing and it was printed. So therefore I had to consider uh, if I was going to have big enough resolution, I was going to have to create larger files for the printer and it was not going to be a vector. So um, it meant I didn't want the work to pixelate. So that can really dictate that I was going to have bigger files and therefore it meant I was going to have to break all the designs up into smaller panels. Like I said before, once I've added in the windows and all the boundaries of um, aircon units and things like that and marked out all those sections, it really gives me a pretty quick idea of what's possible and the canvas is you know, no longer a rectangle, the canvas is this sort of wavy, dippy kind of shape. So therefore, that was going to impact what I could put on it. So yeah, get your measurements sorted, get the, think of this stage as, you know, creating your canvas, your blank canvas to then put your work onto because a lot of the times your canvas, when you're doing this style of work is going to be these irregular odd shapes. And it's not just going to be a pretty four by four square or like a four size, make sure you set yourself up for success and like a smooth process. Number two is talk to your printer at the very beginning. Your printer becomes a really big component to these types of jobs and building really good relationships with them can mean that the project goes really smoothly and it can also lead to a great relationship moving forward and being able to go back to them as like a repeat customer. I also like to think of them as like remembering that they are the master of their craft. You know, I'm the person that's doing the drawing, they're the person that does the printing, and there's a lot of things about printing that I don't understand. There's like finishes and different laminates and metallics and all these different things that I don't know about. And if I don't have a relationship with the printer and talk to them at the beginning, there might be something that they could suggest that could actually elevate the work even better. And there's been a few times where that has happened where because I don't know it, it does because I don't know it exists. I don't know that it's possible. So chatting to them at the very beginning means that they might be able to throw something into the mix that can really elevate everything. And it's just a really good way to think of them. And I haven't even got it plugged in. Okay, so I just realized that my microphone wasn't plugged in that whole time. So obviously the audio is gonna be slightly different. I'm not re-recording this. So yeah, editing Jeff telling you that is why the audio is different. Also, this lighting is probably changing the whole time. It's afternoon and yeah, it's gonna be hot and different. So editing Jeff is gonna love this. The next thing is that also the client might have a preferred printer that they go with, that they already have a relationship with, which I'm always really happy to go with because it just means that it streamlines everything. And also they could already have internal printers, like in-house printers, which um, yeah, it just means it's a really good thing to ask at the very beginning because otherwise if you have to find a printer, then that's another whole element to the process that you have to work out is, yeah, sometimes not fun. But if you've made the relationship with printers, you know you can call on, uh, call on them at some point. So the things I like to talk about with the printer in this first chat are, am I working in M C M Y K or RGB for the print file? Uh, doesn't necessarily matter. Sometimes I've caught myself out working in the wrong color setting. And then when I go to print, it's not the colors that I want. So make sure you have your files set up at the very beginning. Um, file setup. So maybe they have a particular way that they like to receive their files as like a, uh, workable illustrator file, a PDF, depending on, 
yeah, what they like to do, uh, if they need particular bleeds or anything like that, get that information at the very beginning because then if it's something that you don't know how to do, like for me, I struggle with bleeds all the time. So if I can flag that at the very beginning, they might say, that's cool, just send us the file, we'll do the bleeds, it's cool. Or they'll be able to help you along the way. There's nothing worse than trying to send your file on the 11th hour. Um, and going, oh, I still, I don't actually don't know how to, I don't know how to do the bleeds. And then they just get frustrated with you because they just need the file ASAP. So yeah, get all that file, um, deliverable stuff sorted. If there's any specifics about the project that you just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with, it's great to say. So for me, for this project, knowing that the Mardi Gras banner was something that was going to be eventually peeled off and was going to be a separate um, decal. I wanted to make sure that the printer understood that's what was happening and that I was going to give it to him as a separate file and just make sure that we were all on the same page with that logistically because um, that would be bad if it didn't get done the way it was meant to be done. I always like to try and use the same words as what the printer is using so things like you know working out their lingo for like vinyl and all that kind of stuff and then naming all the art bo boards the same as what they are referring it to. So for instance, in this one, I was using the same words that were used on the measurements that they took at the very beginning. So therefore it was really clear that the bleachers went with the bleachers and um, the toilet walls went with the toilet walls. So yeah, it just, make sure that there's no variation or confusion in where artworks go, especially if you've got very similar size um, artworks going across multiple different spaces. And at the very end, I like to also give them a mock-up of the final concept in like, as like a render, like Photoshopped onto the surface. And I send that to the printer and also the client as well, just so we know, you know, this is the final document that they can print out and take with them on site because chances are the person you're talking to on the phone, uh, in the, in the creation process may not be the person who's installing it. And I don't want to rely on anyone else to translate the information. I want to make it simple for my client to hire me and work with me. So if I can just send them those images and a really clear directive of like, this is where the all the files go and the different surfaces they're getting it um, applied to, then it just makes it less likely that you're gonna have an issue. So send that off when you're sending them the final files for print and thank them at the end of the install. Okay, the third one is a big one. So hopefully I explain it well. So it's, I always like to stagger the different stages of developing the artwork to get approvals sort of at, a, at each point. What I mean by that is that I always wanna be efficient with my time and I never wanna waste my time designing something and creating this beautiful final rendering if the client is gonna say, oh, we actually hate that. Let's start again fresh. So I wanna eliminate that process happening because it has happened in the past to me early on. I wanna make sure that I'm slowly building up the design and getting approvals at each point. So by the very end, I'm creating the final version and there's less likely to be the chance of there being a surprise or something not looking like what the client had approved at, at some stage. I'll explain it now so it makes more sense. So at the very beginning of my pitching, I will always do a mock-up first. And it's a rough sketch. It gives an idea of what the final artwork could look like. And I always attach a description with it as well, like a written description to explain the story or the concept behind it because then that then helps to build the whole narrative. I'll also attach other artworks that I've previously done that might give them an idea of how refined the final version could be. So it's like, here's the concept and this is how slick and polished and refined and like textured the 
final artwork is going to be like so they can kind of bridge the gap between it all. And then I'll also put in other reference points if I need to that sort of show the inspiration or the mood or the playfulness of it or whatever it is. This will just make sure that we're on the same page from the very beginning and that we can sign off on that first mock-up concept. So in the end the artwork was called uh, Space, Love and Pride and I really got inspiration from the Rosie Deacon installation that was in the front bar. These are these large scale rings that are just like hanging and it felt very much like outer space. So I wanted the artwork to obviously connect to those because I, th that work is permanent, it's staying there and I want the whole space to feel cohesive. So I made sure that I made a connection to that in my pitch of the concept. And so I came up with this idea of like, what would it look like for Pride to be in space? And that's how I ended up making this design of the floating figures that are like floating around in space above this like bubbly surreal landscape that's all rainbow. And then I also included this picture of floating people because that's the kind of feeling I was wanting to give that these people were just like floating around space. And so putting that all together in my first initial mock-up meant that I wasn't wasting days on a concept. Once I approved it, then I knew I could go on and flesh it out a whole bunch more. So the next stage of this process is to create a refined sample. So think of it as I want to create like 10% of the final work. And then once I approve that, I can then go up to complete the rest of the 90%. Again, not wasting time. What I ended up sharing with the client was I did a mock-up on the a template of the wall of where I could see all the different design elements sitting. It was like a really rough sketch. And then I did a final rendering of the, the different elements so they could see what it could look like. And again, they could bridge the gap between here's a 10% of like what the figures will be. And this is how the organization of the whole artwork could look. And it just gives a really clear idea that like, yes, we're happy with this. And it gives the client a chance to sort of flag something that maybe they misunderstood, or maybe they just like don't necessarily like the coloring of things. You know, there's all these um, points where they can make their changes that you um, can at least address before you do the rest of the work. For this project as well, I decided that I was going to draw all the elements individually on my iPad and then I was going to save them as individual objects or individual files. And then I was going to create the final print version of the artwork in Illustrator and then just use these individual objects and artworks to like populate it. So it was much easier for me to be flexible and move things around and design it in real time rather than creating this one flat artwork that just sort of went across, um, if that makes sense. It also means that I now have all of these elements as individual files that, you know, if the client decided we wanted to create extra assets of digital GIFs or stickers and things like that, I could very easily just pull those out and we can use them. So it creates lots of flexibility um, for the project and also in the future I can use those assets again in other projects and really start to build up um, a library of designs based around these little assets. And then the next stage once they approved this sketch mock-up with the 10% I then would create one of the walls and get their approval and be like yep this is cool make sure the printer understands like my process and my system and then once they approve that it's then roll it out and do the rest of the walls and the rest of the zones and we know that there's going to be no surprises because the client has had an input at each sort of stage and I've made it really clear with visual pictures of what things are going to look like and no surprises. So that's a really handy and great way to approach the design process whilst saving or being like efficient with your time and not getting caught out creating the final artwork before it's actually the right time to create the final artwork. Okay, number four is to consider the scale of your artwork. 
So for me in this design, I had four key elements. There was the figures, there was the Mardi Gras banner, there was the land surface, and then there was the secondary elements of the stars and the rings. And this was always going to be my hierarchy of importance of all the different elements. And so when it came to working out how big to make all of these elements, I had to obviously work between my mock-up design of my sketch and then also making sure that my measurements were the right size and the right scale and the right resolution so that when it gets printed, the artwork wasn't be all pixelated or, you know, you design something and then realize when it's in real life, it's too small altogether. So there's not necessarily, uh, in my eyes, I can't work out a way that's really quick and simple. But essentially what I like to do is from my sketch, my mock-up, I will then draw little, a little box around the figure and then scale that up to the size of the wall. And then I'll be able to tell how big I need to make my figure. And then I would literally pull out a measuring tape and measure it out and be like, okay, at this point, the, the face is 30 by 30 centimeters. I would pull out a piece of paper, measure 30 by 30 and say, this is the size of the face. Does that feel right for the scale of the wall? Yep, cool, that sounds great. Um, how big is the shoe? How big is the hand? How big are the eyes? All those kinds of things. And it just, it's using your visual cues a little bit more to just double, triple check that the way you've scaled everything is going to be good. Sometimes it's also good to use that for your line work as well. If you're doing a thick outline, it's like how thick is the outline going to be? Once it's on your screen, it feels great. But once you print it, how thick is that outline going to be? And working with that, um, potentially talking to your printer as well to help you make sure that you've got the right thickness of lines. Okay, and number five is to create variations between the different spaces. So what I mean by that is obviously having the bleachers, the side gate and the main bar having really different uses and also surface areas and engagement with how people walk around them or walk through the gates or sit on the bleachers means that there's you can really approach the final artwork in different ways and sometimes it has to be considered. So I think this can make the, the overall design for the space much more elevated because it can feel a little bit OTT when you have just like this one image just blasted over everything. It's like the fish and chip shop that just puts their logo on everything everywhere. It's just all too much. But if you approach each space in a little bit more of a considered way, it can just feel so much more elevated. And a really good way for me to think about that for this project with the bleachers, it meant that obviously people are going to sit on the stairs and the steps and going to obstruct a lot of like the bottom two thirds of the artwork. So I knew that there was no point putting a lot of detail there. It was also quite narrow. So I didn't want to have broken heads and things like that. So it made more sense to put a, to extend the floor all the way down or the land all the way down and create this rainbow pattern that's just like a surface repeat pattern. And then making sure the focus was always at the very top where I put all the figures because that's obviously not gonna be covered as much. And when you're looking at it, all the people sit on the stairs and then you've got the artwork at the top. It just makes sense. So having to approach the three different spaces in slightly different ways gives each space a bit more of a different feel. And there's things that I could pull out of these three spaces and explore more in this project or in others. So for instance, for the bleachers, the pattern that was used for the bottom two thirds, you could easily use that as like a feature wall in another room in the venue or for a repeat pattern for like a floor decal. Um, the core flutes elements that are atta um, attached on top of the printing and the side gate is an interesting idea for like more three dimensional builds that I could use down the track. So it's something definitely to think about 
and is a really good um, way to approach different spaces is just um, tweak, to, tweak the designs slightly to make them feel a little bit more special and unique. And that's my five tips for creating artworks for large scale print jobs. I'm really happy with how the project turned out and also I'm really happy that the client is really happy with how the project turned out. Um, I'm definitely interested in exploring these flower characters a whole bunch more. I definitely want to try and do some little animations of them and even the space theme I think could be a really cool animation. There's lots of ideas swirling around my head so I'm gonna probably talk about those in a future video. Um, I also thought it would be a bit more interesting to talk about this project in a slightly different way by sort of you know serving it up as a bunch of tips that would that are hopefully helpful. So if it was helpful, uh, let me know. And if there's anything else you'd like to know about this project or any other project, the way that I organize things or like the process of doing things, I'm more than happy to take suggestions for future videos. Um, if it is something that you found helpful, totally say hello to me on Instagram or in the comments below. I am always open to making more friends. And with that, I'm gonna love you and leave you and I'll see you in the next video, bye.